the headquarters. Last but not the least.
because I, although I could not be the earlier, count of things to do, I am starting my tenure track position, so I start only last July. And the kind of, uh, that I got that position at MIT just recently is a proof that the research opportunities that this data availability presents are huge. So that's great to have the opportunity to present my work to the audience that has the hands directly into the data generation and the device and other kind of things. So, just as a motivation slide, uh, this is an issue that appeared at this, uh, Newsweek in March, both of, and this is a uh, perspective in nature. And you are, we're finding in the last year more and more these kind of articles that are saying the first message is that tomorrow uh, online users are going to be online instead of in the desktop in their hands. This, as it was in the last presentation in the last session, changed the paradigm of the semantic of the internet, of the services, and it means an opportunity to science. In this case, uh, that's why, okay, that's uh, another way of saying this, in this article, uh, okay, the GPS tracking in cell phones could do for real world what Google did for the virtual world, because you know where the people are, who are their friends and where the services are. That's what they mean by Google and the, the mobile phone kind of thing. And in this article that is in April 2009 in Nature, you can see because the mobile phones, the smartphones, are sensors, the opportunities that is behind them, even in some village, they can take a picture of uh, some medical conditions and transmit the information where the doctors are because in the village they don't have the doctors. Of course, we are talking about opportunities in the de developing world. So if we have like little computers that are cheaper and mobile and all this can be addressed in this kind of way. Okay, what I'm gonna be talking about, okay, my research is based on statistical physics to integrate and analyze vast amounts of information and try to uh, generate laws that describe human dynamics. And of course, the less subjective dynamic, if we talk about human dynamics, is trips. That's why in the framework of um, social network and human dynamics, I got more and more interest into trips modeling and location of where devices were the clear uh, sources that I had to analyze. And the nice thing is I want to remind you that statistical physics has the power of trying to express laws, to find the laws in the analysis of the statistic of big numbers. You can see the typical example is the ideal equation of a gas. So we, we, that is, we are trained to try to extract the laws and that is why this re internal research is an interesting for us. And, okay, I'm going to uh, show you, following the title of my presentation was a model human dynamics. Let's see what, how can we develop, given the, that the data is available, how can we develop a model of human dynamics, which means the trajectory in space and time, how the coordinates change, and with the goal is how to model that at a country scale. And that was one of the papers that appeared in nature he was mentioning, and I am covering what appeared in the nature and the new challenges, because the nature appeared a couple of years ago. And let me first of all tell you, of course, this question is old. It's not that now has been added. And the typical, so I'm showing here, the typical framework that had to be done to try to estimate how people move in a city is called activity-based model, or logic models, in which uh, for different number of individuals, they assume that they could have long-term behavior and daily behavior. This is the typical homework commuting. And they can have in the long term some tours. And this is a kind of a uh, trajectories that were modeled and the infor origin of the information were surveyed. And uh, that is the kind of, they were realistic and 
here is where I'm saying the main data resources were household surveys of all trees made in a day. So they could kind of learn from different group of people of the order of hundreds and have some realistic uh, assumption of how people travel in the city and make the applications. The fact that we have location of work devices change completely uh, the picture because we do not need to have surveys and we have detailed information. Here I'm showing GPS. That was uh, just a visualization from one of the students in my class, the analyzing GPS data that was uh, provided by Kentaro to Jam at the Microsoft Research India. And he, you can Google uh, his project is called Project La Chesis. And the idea is uh, how to render and to get information from GPS data. And this is key that used to go a lot to Seattle. And he was here, we can see when he goes home and the office. His office was, was located down here. And that's uh, the way we can, what I can show you here is that very detailed information is provided by the GPS. And we can go to the next slide. Okay. Yes, perfect. Uh, of course, you need the patient to see the trajectory that was uh, shown every five minutes. But after all, what we see is a trajectory like up there that is latitude and longitude. And it's a huge trajectory. Uh, the travels there you went once for a work travel to uh, Florida, to LA, etc., And somewhere in Massachusetts. But he's there in Redmond, uh, Redmond, and we can see clearly what were the two most visited locations there. If we have this kind of information, we can extract the visitation patterns of everyone in a city or, or everyone in a country. And that is the thing. So I'm starting my talk with GPS data just to let you know that you can extract the behavioral patterns without surveys just following the trajectories. But GPS data is the perfect data in which, despite have some uncertainty in the, in the location, you can do rendering. And it's in time of times and uh, accuracy the best. And we could uh, obtain this kind of in these activities is uh, the percentage of activities distribution. OK, you have found home, office, between home and office is his traveling time, neighboring time, in the Seattle that he went a lot to the city. So this is the kind of thing we can extract for all the individuals if we have this kind of thing. And here is how it looks. I'm going to show you how this data looks with the mobile phones, because that is our idea. Pop scale, this kind of model using imperfect data that is the mobile phone data. So here, look at this trajectory. Have, we have hours, here is one week. And what you can see the periodicity, here is latitude. You can clearly see the home and work periodic behavior and some other no typical activities. Here is what it looks. Three trajectories taken, taken from mobile from users. If the users are active, it's not so bad. For example, you can, we can see in the green trajectory someone that has some the longest commuter is here is green user. The red user, you compare it to the GPS, you can see more or less what are the most frequent locations, some others that are not so frequent, and you can extract something. But the goal is to complete that kind of information. And the problem is that sometimes, where the circle or the ellipse is, they stop calling, and then we don't have the way to complete. We could feel and say, okay, the person is st stay there, but if it was a mall, it doesn't make sense. So how to complete this information? Or how to use this information is a research question. And that was the paper about that was published two, year, two years ago. And then the first thing we have to be aware of is that a spatial limitation, different from GPS, we have that we can assume the person is anywhere within the area of coverage of the tower. Then it means the kind of behavior we're going to be able to measure is not just walking 
at a room level or at a, inside a campus. It's like previous stories of CPS. We are going to be able to have commuting information. And we already see here, like for this user, he has about 200 uh, usage of the call, 67, 96, and some more here. Most of the time, he's in an area. That's why we decide to quantify the radius, the radius of this area. And then what we did is for 100,000 users at a country scale to see what was the typical radius within which each user was most likely to be found during six months. And this five years is a distribution. And then one may think, okay, but what happens if I never use the phone? How this, uh, because there is a heterogeneous uh, usage of the phone by the users. We got this D2, data 2 set. It's more noisy because there were only 1,000 users that were people that they applied to traffic forecasting and pollen forecasting. And then the company would provide the coordinate, coordinate of them every hour. And then we could see the cutoff here means that we cannot uh, measure a uh, distance that are further away than what can be uh, measured in an hour. But that is the kind of behavior we observe. Ah, no, no, that's uh, sorry. The cutoff in the RG we can measure because I, I was talking about other things. So in this case, it's, what we are observing is that it's the same distribution. When we do delta R, that is the typical trip length, we have another distribution, and for the user of one hour, it appears more like here. So the maximum, so it has the same shape and the here. So it's just a consistency observation. So we can, uh, we have very complete data and not so complete, and still you can detect the most visible location and their business. This provides uh, the opportunity to, I mean, this uh, observation told us that means that the people is, of course they are not in jail, but this is a consequence that is a trajectory in which there is a lot of repetitions. And this brought us to calculate the PL, where L is the frequency, a PL is the frequency of time a location, a, a user is in location L. Imagine a person visit only five locations during the six month. Then one is the first visit, so the one that has the largest fraction of visits, and is decreasing. The interesting thing is we have users that most of the time visit only five locations, and others that visit 50. By definition, this is decreasing, but it's decreasing in the same shape, and this is a zip flow. In terms of modeling, if we see the same flow in another scale, in the inset, we see that the first location is visited around 50% of the time. It's found the user there with the mobile phone. And the number two location is around 20, so more or less 70% of the time, so the first and second, 70% of the time we find the users in the two most visited locations. And we can know that for every single user of the country. And we know that the mobile phone penetration, even in developing countries, is a starting exponent, is increasing exponentially. So this has a very interesting source of information. What we did, because the topic, I mean, the close research after the nature was, uh, okay, we observed pattern of visitation. We could not do with a mobile phone to know how long they <coughs> stay and when they go, because of the limitation of the calling. I can see the most visit location, but I, I cannot know when. What we did is something that's called data integration. Let's try to explore all the data sets. And here I'm showing a smart card. And we see the same periodicity with the smart cards. And we use the data from the subway cards of the London subway stations. And we could detect, just doing the same ranking of what is the first location that we call that is where they live, the second is where they work, and the others, the same kind of PL analysis. is recreation. We could see recreation is at Piccadilly Circle. And 
What we were interested in is to extract distribution of trip length and stay time. And we could see that the first and second location have peaks in 8 and 14 hours here. And this is work. So we can generate a model. We can know these distributions integrated with what uh, uh, the mobile phone provider. So using mobile phone data, the smartphone data, we develop a model, which is here. This is what uh, it doesn't, it didn't appear in the, in the metro paper, but we are using some kind of temporal information that we obtain from other sources. That is uh, in terms of, so what we do here, what we do is this kind of uh, analysis, I cannot go into the detail because it will take too long, but that is what we are observing is in this preference of, of location we are, we have the model in red and the data in blue. So as you see here on top, these differences in the blue and the red is not perfect. That is why this paper is still not published, but don't, uh, only with some statistical assumption, a state time distribution and ranking of location, we can really provide uh, this kind of behavior. That is, each dog is a new search. If you see at peak hours, everyone goes to the center and go back. So we can have a large scale uh, modeling of how people visit the land without making assumption of agent base, mostly in distribution and using large amount of data. Then, Okay, that was one word, modern trajectories. Now I, I don't have more time, do I? He's keeping the time. <laughs> okay, I can, I'm not going to show you like detailed information, but it's very interesting to talk about the research perspective. In the natural paper, we have the trajectories in abstract. We call PL, first visit, second visit, etc. Now I am in a civil and environmental engineering department. It's not enough to have the location they visit as abstract trajectory. We need to know how they go. And the beautiful thing is like, if you know, when you, each of us use Google Map, you know your house, you know your work. The route you use that Google Map tell you, well, I mean, I know my house, I, I knew I, had, I was coming here and use Google Map. The route <coughs> is just done by what is called a route finding algorithm. That's what we did, and now I'm concentrating, not at a country scale for the behavioral models, but I am using one million mobile phone data users in the Boston area. And we apply the route fund to the community behavior, and that is what we are observing. And of course, in order to, as you know, always keep in mind that the mobile phone data have limitation. We need always to validate our models, and we have the mass top data, and then we can calibrate the model and say, if this amount of people is gonna travel n kilometers, we have to distribute the mode of transportation. Which fraction uses public transportation, which are walking. But the nice thing about this, different from particles, humans have finite modes of transportation, and there are not so many options. When I'm going to Belmont, from Belmont, where I live, to MIT, there are like four modes, no, only two modes. I'm not gonna walk. Either take the bike, the bus, or drive, three modes, and few routes that are the most common. We validate the traffic, and we can have now the mobility mode, I mean, the kind of trajectories. It's an assumption, but the beautiful thing is that it can be done not only in Boston, it can be done anywhere where the CDRs, the billing information is done, that is in other countries as well. And this continues, uh, for example, here I'm showing, MassDot again is providing the data, real time information, this is a boss. Of course, the time I'm putting it a little bit fast, not to get you bored, but we are knowing where the 543 buses in the same area are. What it gives me, the velocity. I can have an, an estimate of the volume. The mobile phone cannot tell, it's not a GPS, cannot tell me the velocity but I can use the buses to know the velocity. If I know the traffic and the accurate velocity of the street, we can have a unique and new method 
to uh, measure energy consumption, uh, which means fuel emission. And that is the research I'm doing right now with this Boston data. And uh, just to give you an idea of the scales, here is Middlesex County. Here is this square here, which is zone there. Uh, I'm really Somewhere here is MIT, I cannot see it now. Okay, great. <laughs> here is MIT. So most of our colleagues work at most in the neighboring towns. So here I'm putting all the population, and it looks in the Middlesex County is as small as this little square. The transportation network models that are used today are, are at county level. If you say, okay, I, can, I want to know the transportation model of commuting in the US census, it's going to be at the county level. The, that it means that we are going to have all the commuting from this huge area, which is a county, to the neighboring counties. But most of the commuting happens inside this square. And this is the, the kind of thing we are working is trying to develop transportation networks at a completely new scale. And this is possible because the data available that before it was not. So we are combining data and also we have land use. Here is the same map in which uh, we use GIS and we say, okay, each color represents residential and uh, here is MIT is uh, pink, means pro pink means prof professional and institution, beige, which is the most of the area is residential. We have a commercial in yellow, water in blue, green. So we can have digital information on top of which our users are, and we can know with colors which kind of places they are. And then that would give a lot of richness to our behavior. That is the message. And here is the, how we look at the distribution of population. Here is latitude, so I took one, one uh, line here, and see, here is number of people that live there. So it's, it changes a lot. In order to see how people travel, I'm talking about not individual anymore, but aggregated travel, that means transportation network. How to generate a transportation network at this scale is hard, but now we're working on that. That is a very nice model that uses multiplicative random processes, and it's very interesting how can we, with the data and modeling techniques, generate similar uh, behaviors. And this is how is that I was showing you only middle sex, but we are talking about these uh, interesting patterns that for us is, has very interesting physical properties, and statistical physical properties, can be generated by a multiplicative random process. And here we have this data, not now from white phones is from Oak Ridge National Lab that have the best uh, distribution description of the distribution of people on Earth. And we are trying to model this again with our techniques to see what is the probability of finding a travel, a trip, but a very small scale. It's not at a county scale. That's the message. Where is the top? Well, that is how the model looks. It's quite similar. And it's, uh, but I'm not going to tell you much more. In conclusion, what we are trying to do with this combination of the statistical physics and data is pattern of energy consumption, road network comparative study, because we can have 20 metropolitan cities, uh, metropolitan areas, sorry, interactions with public transportation, as we all learn all that with a goal, like for example, that people use more public transportation or, or do car sharing. And to understand using the research view how people interact with space. And let me see, I can say. My collaborators is uh, on top the student and missing this picture, and the professors at MIT, with Naya Wilson working the subway data, with Daniele Veneziano in the multiplicative random process, and with Nathan Eagle from Santa Fe Institute. He is providing me with 19 cities to compare the all what I told you was either told in the US or Europe, but he has mobile phone data from Africa, countries in Africa and South America, and then we are trying to see some changes with income. Uh, 